Hi everyone, in this video we're going to wrap up our carbohydrate section and in the next video we'll move on to lipids. So let's talk a little bit more about monosaccharide reactions. Now one reaction that can occur with monosaccharides or disaccharides is oxidation. So if a sugar can be oxidized, it's called a reducing sugar. So it reduces something while it's oxidized. So all monosaccharides are reducing sugars. Um, and one test we can do to determine if we have a reducing sugar is called Benedict's reagent test. So Benedict's reagent contains copper two plus ions, which will create a blue color. So for instance, down below, we have a test tube containing Benedict's reagent, which is blue due to those copper two plus ions. And then if we add that to our samples, uh, the first sample is a glucose solution. The second one is a galactose solution. We're going to end up producing um, different colors. So glucose will turn kind of a murky green color and galactose will turn an orange color. Now, this is due to the production of a precipitate called copper one oxide. So Cu2O. Um, and then we also produce an oxidized sugar as well. Now you'll be able to see this reaction in your lab video for the week. Um, so keep an eye out for that. It is kind of cool to see those colors changing. Another reaction that can occur is with um, the OH groups on our monosaccharides. So those can behave as alcohols since it is an OH group and they can react with acids, especially phosphoric acid and we'll end up forming um, esters. So down below, after the reaction with phosphoric acid, we end up with this PO4 two minus that is connected to our um, sixth carbon on glucose. Uh, similarly, with fructose, we can end up with the same thing, a phosphate group on the sixth carbon in the ring, so the last carbon in the ring. Now, cyclic monosaccharide hemiacetals and hemiketals can also react with alcohols to form acetals and ketals, referred to as glycosides. So as an example, let's say that we start with alpha-D-glucose. So remember, in the cyclic form, we have our anomeric carbon, which is to the right of oxygen, and the OH group could either be up or down. In this case, it's down, so we're going to call that alpha. And then the D part is just referring to that second to last OH group. And in the open chain form of the sugar, it was on the right. So that's where the D is coming from. Now, as it stands right now, we have a hemiacetal molecule because we have this OR group and then an OH group. But what if we turn that OH group into an OR group? Then it would become an acetyl. So we're going to react all of this with an alcohol. So our OH group here will react with the alcohol and we'll end up replacing that OH with OCH3 from the alcohol. And then the OH that we had before will react with the hydrogen from the alcohol to create water. All right. Now we end up with two products here, one where the OCH3 points down and one where it points up. So we've got alpha D and beta D. And don't worry about the other names. 
or the other parts of the names. But these new products, which are acetyls, because we have an OR group here and an OR group here, um, these are also called glycosides. So the new carbon-oxygen carbon linkage that joins the components of the glycoside is called a glycosidic linkage. So this uh, purple bond here is our glycosidic linkage. Now, glycosides do not exhibit an open chain form, so they're just stuck in that ring form. But our previous uh, hemiacetyl could go back to the open chain form under equilibrium conditions. Now, glycosides also are not reducing sugars, so they cannot be oxidized. All right, so that was it for reactions. And uh, the last thing I wanted to do was go over some important monosaccharides, disaccharides, and polysaccharides. Um, so let's start with monosaccharides. A couple of really important ones are ribose and deoxyribose. Now, you can see their structures down below. And they're both pentoses, which means they both have five carbons in their chains. And both of these are used in the synthesis of DNA and RNA. Now, DNA is what makes up our uh, genetic identity, right? Um, RNA is kind of similar. We'll talk about that later. So Again, just keep these two in mind, ribose and deoxyribose, because those will become really important later on. Now, glucose, we've talked about a lot. Um, this is a hexose, so it has six carbons in its chain, and it's the most nutritionally important monosaccharide. Sometimes it's called dextrose or blood sugar. Now, glucose is the compound um, to which other sugars absorbed into the body must be converted in the liver. So if you're digesting or metabolizing other sugars, they need to be converted into glucose. And glucose can also be used as a sweetener in, you know, desserts or other foods. The next monosaccharide is galactose. This is also a hexose, so it has six carbons. It has a very similar structure to glucose. It's a component of lactose, which is the sugar found in milk, um, and it's a component of substances present in nerve tissue. Um, fructose is a ketohexose. So this one actually has a ketone at the top, you might remember from our previous lecture, and it has six total carbons. Now, because it has that ketone at the top instead of an aldehyde, we actually end up with a five-membered ring when we look at the cyclic form. Now, fructose is the sweetest monosaccharide. We saw the table of uh, relative sweetness before, so this is the sweetest one. And sometimes this is called levulose or fruit sugar. Um, fructose is also present in honey in a one-to-one -one ratio with glucose. So keep that in mind for the lab that we're doing this week. Fructose is also very abundant in corn syrup. So if you've heard of fructose corn syrup before, now you know what the fructose part looks like. So let's move on to disaccharides. So remember, disaccharides have two monosaccharide units linked together, either by acetyl or keto glycosidic linkages, which we just talked about. So a glycosidic linkage is identified by the numbers associated with the carbon atoms joined together and the configuration of the linkage for any anomeric carbon atom joined by the linkage. So a lot of words there. Let's kind of break it down. So let's say we're trying to combine two alpha-D glucose monosaccharides. 
So notice that the OH group on the first glucose molecule is pointing down, which is why it's alpha. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna link that to carbon four on our second alpha D glucose. So that's going to give us an oxygen in between carbon one from the first glucose and carbon four on the second glucose. Now, because it's pointing down, we're gonna call this an alpha glycosidic linkage, and we're connecting carbon one to carbon four. So this is called an alpha one four glycosidic linkage. And this particular disaccharide is called maltose. So maltose is malt sugar. So if you've ever had like a malt milkshake, uh, that's what's present in it. And I think you can just buy maltose at the store if you wanted to make your own uh, maltose desserts or beverages at home. So again, we saw on the last slide, if we join two glucose units together by an alpha 1,4 glycosidic linkage, that's going to give us maltose. Now, this is also formed during the digestion of starch to glucose, and we'll talk about starch in a little bit. Maltose is found in germinating grain. It's a hemiacetal, and that tells us that it is a reducing sugar, so it can be oxidized. So notice the hemiacetal group on maltose down below. Now, you can also hydrolyze maltose and go back to the two glucose molecules. So you can reverse the reaction that we saw on the last slide by adding water. Another important disaccharide is lactose. So we already said this is uh, present in milk. And uh, lactose is actually composed of galactose and glucose units. So those are monosaccharides. Now those are actually joined by something called a beta 1,4 glycosidic linkage. So notice here, oops, notice that the glycosidic linkage is pointing up towards the second unit. So because it's pointing up, that means we have a beta linkage instead of an alpha linkage. Now this is also a hemiacetal. We've got that hemiacetal group there. So that means lactose is also a reducing sugar and it can be oxidized. Sucrose is also an important disaccharide. This is just common household sugar that you would have uh, for your tea or your coffee or for baked goods, etc. Um, and it's composed of fructose and glucose units that are joined by an alpha-1, beta-2 glycosidic linkage. So let's break that down. So here we're joining an alpha-D glucose unit with a beta-D fructose unit. So initially we had an OH group here that was pointing down. So that's why it was alpha. And our second unit originally had an OH group pointing up. So that was a beta unit. So because the first part was pointing down, that's the alpha one. And then the second part was pointing up, so that's beta two. So it sounds really complex, but when you break it down, it just has to do with whether the bond is pointing up or down. Now, sucrose is found in many different plants, especially sugar cane and sugar beets. This is actually not a reducing sugar, so it cannot be oxidized. Um, however, you can hydrolyze it, so you can add water to it, and that will cause it to break apart into glucose and fructose units. All right, last but not least, let's talk about some important polysaccharides. So 
remember polysaccharides are um, basically really long chains of monosaccharide units. You can have hundreds of thousands of monosaccharide units in a polysaccharide. They're not water soluble, um, but the hydroxy groups present on each unit will become hydrated individually if you expose them to water. Now, uh, one example of a polysaccharide is starch, and this can be used as a thickener in sauces, gravies, and other foods, for instance. So if you've used it before, um, now we're gonna look at the structure. So again, starch is a polymer or a polysaccharide consisting of many glucose units. So down below, you can see just a portion of starch and notice that it has really similar connections here that we've seen before called the alpha-1,4 glycosidic linkage. So all of the glucose units will be connected in this way. Starch is also a major storage form of D-glucose in plants, so you could hydrolyze it to get glucose units. Another polysaccharide that's really important is glycogen, um, also referred to as animal starch. And again, this is a polymer of glucose units, and it's used by animals to store glucose, especially in the liver and muscles. And we're also included in that animal category. Another important polysaccharide is cellulose. So you might have heard of this before. Um, this is also a polymer of glucose units, and it's a really important structural polysaccharide. It's the most abundant organic compound on Earth because it's found in plant cell walls, and that's what gives plants their uh, structure. Now, uh, cellulose is not easily digested, but it is a constituent of dietary fiber. And here is the structure of cellulose. So we have those um, glucose units, but this time instead of an alpha 1,4 linkage, we have a beta 1,4 linkage. So it's slightly different and just different enough that we get a different polysaccharide. All right. So that's it for carbohydrates. Uh, next time, we're going to talk about lipids. Um, and remember, we're joining together Chapter 17 and Chapter 18. Um, so this is all part of this week's content. So I will see you in the next video.